Welcome uh, to the webinar. We will be talking about uh, chemicals and materials today and specifically about strategies for data-driven R&D. I'm Max Peterson and I'm AVP of Chemicals and Materials Marketing. My role within Dotmatics is twofold. I work uh, with customers and uh, uh, prospects to understand their requirements and uh, I also work with our R&D team to define the strategy for the chemicals materials uh, market and specifically am responsibility for the, uh, responsible for the formulations capabilities within our platform. So uh, what do we want to accomplish today? is to give a very brief introduction into Dotmatics for those who don't know us yet. Then I will talk about uh, what uh, data-driven R&D is and why it's important. And then I'm going to talk about how a platform approach is really needed to implement uh, data-driven R&D. I'm going to talk about our approach to implementing this platform and then uh, uh, finish up with a couple of customer case studies. So um, Dotmatics has as a uh, goal to combine a scientific platform with best of breed applications to enable collaboration, automation and insights. So I already mentioned how the uh, uh, platform is really essential for data-driven R&D. Not going to talk so much about applications, but ultimately what they do is to basically tie everything together. Uh, uh, Dotmatics is now a cus uh, company that serves over 2 million scientists, has over 10k customers and is uh, uh, represented in uh, a lot of large uh, pharma companies. Uh, one in five uh, scientists use our solution. And uh, uh, while there's an impressive list of pharma companies, uh, and today we're talking about chemicals materials companies, so I wanted to just put up some of the logos that uh, will either be reflected in our presentation today mentioned or uh, um, that have talked uh, publicly uh, about our approaches. So with that, I, um, I'm going to talk about the uh, general philosophy of our uh, platform approach. So the idea is that uh, uh, in a lab or in an R&D organization, fundamentally we will have this uh, decide, make, test cycle that basically requires different capabilities to be supported uh, when we're covering this entire innovation cycle. Now, within the decide phase, we need to be able to predict uh, new properties, we need to be able to visualize results and model data. So this is very much at the core of what data-driven R&D aims at. But in order to support this, we really need to be able to capture information and that's where systems like ELN and LIM systems come into play. And then we need to carry out the test where we are needing to analyze data and acquire information from instruments. And then in order to apply this to different uh, uh, um, uh, disciplines we need to layer on top of that uh, capabilities like biology, chemistry, formulations and data management to basically be able to have the right uh, information context for the scientists. Now uh, 
carrying on to the topic of data-driven R&D. Yeah, when you're thinking about what digitalization objectives are uh, uh, around, uh, there is basically things that come into mind. And there is, uh, of course, at the lowest level, individual productivity. Yeah, and if you think back at the disruptions uh, that the uh, pandemic brought us, there were really questions like, how do I support a remote or hybrid uh, workforce? How can I get my work done? Uh, how can I remotely operate a lab infrastructure? Uh, um, how can I use this uh, very expensive infrastructure when I'm away from my desk? So digitalization certainly plays a role, a very strong role in, in supporting that. Um, and the number of, or the amount of data that is basically being produced and entered is of course a, is a, the largest. Yeah. And this test and make desi uh, decide cycle really in the test area is where most of the activity uh, actually happens. So it's really important to be able to provide a streamlined capability around that to basically being able to access this data, capture it in a high quality manner. But then as the next level, we have basically things like uh, operational excellence. You know, how can I make sure that this uh, remote or hybrid workforce can effectively collaborate? Yeah, um, and this is kind of a one thing we saw is that there were huge disruptions and uh, can we now f provide a framework for um, being able to operate in that environment. And we had a very interesting presentation at our last user group meeting uh, from uh, Valentina Woodcraft from DuPont who really talked about how uh, their decision to work with Dogmatics was really driven by this need for having a framework where they can carry on innovating throughout a situation where they could not work the way they were used to. Right, and then there's the question about data automation. How can I get decision critical data faster to scientists and project teams? And then on the top of that, you have basically a desire to use the data in a way that accelerates innovation. And that's really where data-driven R&D comes into play. You know, if you think about uh, our sustainability crisis, right, we're in California, we were just uh, in a mighty weak heat wave, we have droughts, and I, I cannot think of anything more pressing than, than finding solutions that will help us address the uh, crisis that we're steering towards, right? And uh, yeah, innovate faster, uh, make more with what you already have. These are really the driving forces behind um, uh, data-driven R&D. Now, why is this so hard? The issue is that uh, really the, uh, the desire is to, to innovate, of course, more or less at the device level. Yeah, if I'm thinking about uh, the changes that come, or the changes for tires, for example, in the context of uh, e-mobility are quite drastic. But of course, nobody can operate uh, at that level, just innovating new tires and testing them on the road. There's a whole uh, sequence of uh, abstractions of the problem that can go all the way down to the uh, molecular level. But typically we find uh, many more intermediates. Yeah, we will have uh, feedstocks or uh, representative uh, units that can represent the uh, certain uh, characteristics of the materials that we're innovating on 
and then we can carry out tests against them. And really, uh, when it comes down to it, and this is kind of a quote here from Michael Schwartz, our SVP of, uh, um, of strategy, is that really 80% of decision support is based on connecting structural properties to test data. And this is really at the core of what a informatics system has to provide. But it's of course changing because we have so many different data types and as a consequence, 80% uh, of this R&D data is actually stuck. I also see a life sciences centric view on it, but you could draw the same picture for chemicals materials. Uh, we have many different data so repositories. And uh, this is illustrated here for, again, a uh, tire, uh, uh, typical tire R&D uh, team yeah, that has uh, advanced materials groups, they have compounding groups, they have uh, raw materials groups, they have plant engineering, and they all interact with different types of labs that provide different kinds of uh, um, information that need to be matched up to the properties of the materials that they're trying to innovate on. Yeah? And really uh, the first thing that needs to be solved is solving this data interoperability challenge. Now what really compounds the problem is that the way how we're doing uh, research has fundamentally changed in recent years with the advent of data modeling capabilities. Right? In the olden days, so to say, it was actually a pretty simple uh, data life cycle that we needed to support. Uh, there was data generation, uh, that this was means that there was some kind of an instrument or a measurement that would create uh, output data. And they would typically be transient, right? An instrument would write a fire, and then a technician or a scientist would come along, make sure that the instrument ran properly, and then process the data and extract some kind of a feature or a signal. Yeah? And at that point, uh, maybe you would start thinking about saving some of this data. Yeah? That you say, well, I extracted these signals from my tests. Let me put that into an ELN or into a lab notebook. But certainly I'm not going to store all these instrument files, but because what, how, how am I going to actually use them uh, five years from now? Right. So data sharing maybe happened at a point where I'm creating the data and then sending them to a scientist. But data retention actually happened much later. And there may be some data automation for doing this uh, verification and processing exercise. Right? And then at the end, I would take these signals or results, I would interpret them, I would compare them and draw some conclusions out of them. Right, and I would again uh, retain that data and then uh, I would write a report uh, and then design a new set of experiments and then do this all over again. Now what happened today is that basically I'm having a lot of these loops uh, and uh, I actually have uh, data management happen at the point of data generation. Because fundamentally um, what data modeling requires is that I don't want to make a a priori determination of what data is important. Maybe there's another signal that is relevant and I may want to revisit the data. So basically there's now a requirement of doing data retention much earlier in the data life cycle. Right. I may have to do data reductions uh, and data analyses in a much more uh, circular and much more intertwined uh, system. Right, and that with that we have a lot of new challenges that are coming 
onto it. Now, uh, anything from IOLT environments to bias risk, lack of standardization, uh, context tracking, metadata enrichment, retention policies, fragmentation of data silos. So um, the data landscape has actually uh, become increasingly uh, complex and uh, uh, requires a much more um, holistic way of looking at the data. And that's kind of where the uh, importance of the platform approach comes into play. Yeah. If I'm looking at a traditional uh, landscape of systems that store scientific data, I can divide them first of all into two big categories. Ones that are uh, concerned with the data generation and ones that are concerned with data consumption. Within data generation we have equipments, samples and experiments. Yeah, An equipment will be for example interfacing with an SDMS system or for chromatography system uh, data we have of course CTS and uh, then in the next step I need to associate the uh, equipment information with samples that is typically done with the limb system we have sample management assay management maybe more upstream in life sciences but by in general there is a, a separate system now coming into play to connect them and then when it comes to experiments, that's kind of the domain of uh, electronic lab notebooks. But of course, in more um, uh, structured environments uh, like manufacturing, I may just go and use the same limb system. But then I have request management system, lab execution systems and manufacturing execution systems to basically help me carry out the experimental workload. Now all of this information has to bubble up into the uh, data consumption systems like statistics, fundamental sciences, system level modeling, or dashboards, uh, or systems that are really about uh, the decision making process. Uh, data visualization, project or portfolio management, so really the challenge is that we have two problems here. Yeah? The, for, the first problem, the small problem is how do I connect all the lab data to all the experiment data? And then how do I elevate all of that information into the uh, data consumption layer? Now the reality in many chemicals and materials applications is that uh, not everything fits at ne as neatly into these categories uh, and uh, if we're taking here an example of a flavor and fragrances uh, application we, we will have uh, typical data silos which may or may not be kind of a mainstream application like formulations or analytical tests and ingredients but there will be very specialized data silos as well, like uh, flavor and taste profiles, food safety data, and uh, field testing and panel results. Now, uh, when we're mapping them onto workflows, we will see that uh, in order to, uh, to basically uh, solve the workflow challenge, for example, in formula development, I may need access to many of these uh, data silos to basically make a design of experiment or to decide what to do next. The same in field testing. I may need uh, food safety data, I may need information on the ingredients. So again, I need to straddle many of these data silos. And the same is true for QA, QC and so on and so forth. 
And then on the data analytics side, uh, we have uh, problems around scent modeling or taste modeling, where we need uh, obviously information of what's in there and connect it to flavor profiles. But I may also want to consume analytical tests to do my modeling. So again, a, a pretty complex uh, data interoperability challenge. And uh, when you're thinking that through, you logically arrive at a point where you need to implement a platform approach. And now I want to show you that uh, uh, how we're doing that in our software. And I want to discuss our approach to implementing a platform that is uh, useful for data-driven research. And instead of continuing with the PowerPoint presentation, I'm actually going to switch directly to the software. We're now in the Dogmatics ELN, and you can see that there are a series of formulations experiments. I'm going to open one up. You see that there is uh, metadata associated with it. And this is really important if you wanted to, for example, link this to a um, customer request or any other external project uh, management data. So uh, what we really want to focus here is on what are some of the integration points and the platform capabilities that really exchange information between different systems and allow you to centralize information. So here is a formulation. Uh, I'm actually showing a tableting example. <coughs> and you can see that there's a list of ingredients. I could choose other ingredients from a database. More about that later. Uh, once these are chosen, they can assume different roles. There can be filler material, there can be coatings, there can be anti-adherence, and so on and so forth. I can actually specify these here, and this is basically controlled by a dictionary that is stored somewhere. And basically, uh, this is not where the uh, story ends. Of course, I have more ingredient properties that are really relevant when I'm defining these experiments. So I can open this tab here where I can take a deeper look at the ingredient properties that define my formulation. I can see here that there are actually a list of the ingredients for the formulations that we're specifying. Um, and then there's more information associated with them and these all come from different data repositories that are basically now exposed to the platform and can be consumed here. I can also see where these ingredients actually live within uh, the inventory. So I have barcode information, I have container information, and so on and so forth. I can see whether the ingredients are expired or not. So um, of course, now I'm operating against the dogmatics inventory system, but it is not a necessary or necessarily a typical situation. There may be other inventory locations, most famously they could reside in your ERP. But uh, let's just take a look at the information that sits in the dogmatics inventory. I have. Uh, uh, here the different bins and if you may have uh, noticed actually all our excipients are coming from this bin number two and I can see all the information is listed, what's available, uh, is it checked in or is it checked out and so on and so forth. So um, this allows me to basically tie these two systems together and since they are connected via the platform, the information exchange is seamless. So I get this uh, view not only on the inventory locations, but also on more detailed properties of these uh, ingredients. 
and they are actually stored in a registration system that allows us to define these entities and give them properties. And this is actually done in our biological registration system and we're using this here really in the spirit of a um, generalized entity registration system uh, where I have uh, defined equipments, excipients and analytical solutions. So if we take here a list at the excipients, I can open those up and then I can see all the properties that are actually reflected in the ELN uh, defined here. And this is something that the user can do uh, in a self-service fashion. There's no uh, dark magic here involved. This is uh, basically at the, uh, of course, there need to be some control for uh, uh, data quality purposes, but basically this is uh, no programming necessary. It's actually done via a CSV type interface where I can expose everything. So now the same is true for a sample tracking. Each of these formulations here can be uh, uh, associated with samples and this is a one-to-many relationship. I can create arbitrarily many samples associated with each of these formulations and I can then uh, show them in this uh, list of samples and I can also see where they are uh, uh, located, I can add them to the inventory and then of course I can, uh, and this is again operating against the inventory system and then I can uh, connect the samples up to our request management system and this basically now allows me to um, farm or work out to my colleagues and basically um, now uh, create a collaborative framework where I can uh, shove work back and forth. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to uh, take the sample and uh, uncheck the other ones and if I want to place a request here, I could say that I would want to do a HPLC analysis and then I can transfer this into my uh, queue to the analytical team and then when I submit this request now I have basically sent out a request uh, to, to the other team and then if I refresh this page here Let's just go back into the experiment and into the test requests. I can now see that I have a new request uh, in the queue. So uh, the point here is that I'm actually straddling uh, various systems. Of course I am in the ELN which will keep track of my experiments, the metadata. I may connect those into other systems that may track uh, project information but uh, even in this very simple system I have tied into the inventory system I've tied into the um, uh, request management system and into the registration system that defines the properties of my uh, excipients and uh, um, in real life, in many of our customer installations, these are actually third-party systems. But since they are, the data is ingested into the platform, the operational framework is exactly the same. So um, this is all I wanted to say about the uh, capabilities of our approach. Happy to discuss more. I hope that gave you a quick flavor. Uh, and now let's uh, talk about some uh, customer stories. So how do our customers benefit from the .NETx platform? Well, first, uh, let's take a look at uh, two press releases from last year that really talk about how um, data-driven research 
is a major uh, objective for these organizations. So first let's look at Archema. They state in their press release that their objective is to ensure digital continuity of all experimental data and that that will allow them for faster innovation of chemicals and materials driven by statistics, calculation and modeling and artificial intelligence. So a very clear goal that uh, they found in Dogmatics the right partner to basically find a framework how they can basically capture experimental data and then make them useful for data-driven research to accelerate innovation. And then Crowder has a very similar objective, namely that they also want to accelerate innovation delivery, enhance customer collaborations and generate growth by uh, helping Crowder to become data-driven, uh, that will help them to innovate and move the company towards data mining and providing a foundation for artificial intelligence. So again, a recognition that if you are serious about implementing data modeling approaches, you need to get your data under control first. Now, uh, let's talk a moment about Clarion. Uh, and Clarion is an interesting case study because they basically came to Dogmatics and said, we have, apart from a few limb system, really no uh, digital infrastructure for our R&D uh, uh, teams. And they said that they were basically cover all their major business areas, which is care chemicals, catalysis, and natural resources, and to implement what they call the media break free environment, which basically means that a researcher within Clarion will work within this environment and basically never do any data recording or uh, administrative work outside of the platform. So this is a pretty large scale project, encompasses over 900 users. And uh, uh, we should mention that this is not a uh, simple rollout of a, a productivity tool, but this is really something that fundamentally changes how uh, business is conducted. And you can see this from a rather lengthy uh, project time and also the number of in, uh, employees that we are engaged within this project. But as a result, uh, Clarion and Dogmatics basically now work and uh, have a, created a very strong partnership and we're covering, uh, of course, platform strategy uh, integrating of key productivity systems and facilitating collaboration and knowledge management. We uh, cover their lab digitization needs that include sample management, request management and general data management. Some of the stuff that we have already seen in this very brief demo. There is the formulation development and that's where we have uh, worked very closely together to build out these capabilities. And then of course, in other areas, we are also leveraging the uh, chemistry and biology capabilities within the platform. Uh, Fermanich is another very interesting one. Uh, during one of our user symposia, um, uh, Marco Pacchiani actually gave a presentation that really was talking about how Dogmatics helped uh, Fermanich to become more uh, data driven. And as you may know, Fermanich is the world's largest privately owned flavors and taste company. And really, what the Dogmatics project was about to not start from scratch like Clarion, but to address a very specific uh, legacy IT shortcomings 
uh, in terms of data accessibility. The ability to configure roles and workflows was really important to them. And also the fact that they could move everything into the cloud and find a uh, partner with collaborative spirit. So in this presentation he talked how uh, uh, using Dogmatics they could increase data utilization and reduce workflow complexity. Now, uh, uh, another very interesting use case was uh, with uh, BSF AgroSciences in a project that was called Data to Value. And there is a very detailed uh, use case uh, document that you can uh, um, access on our website. But the, the gist of it is that uh, this project actually ran in three phases. And this is actually pretty typical about how uh, these projects evolve, that they start out with really looking at very specific gaps in capabilities that existed. And that was in this case, uh, scientific data visualization. Right. They had a lot of data sitting in a bespoke data warehouse, and they were just using Excel to visualize the data. So we came in with a data visualization capability that could uh, deal with their chemistry and also with their scale of data that they were looking at. So needed a tool to deal with huge amounts of data. Next, we basically started building a more flexible query framework that sat on top of that bespoke data warehouse and that then allowed the scientist to uh, take more information out of these warehouses and really getting full access to the data. And then in phase three, we started uh, with a uh, replacement of a legacy ELN, which basically now took them full circle that they basically now can uh, input the data using dotmatics into a system that then later on uh, uh, provides them with the data access. So uh, what were some of the key learnings for him? Really, this was about uh, really covering the design circle that we mentioned earlier on. And uh, um, the recognition is that projects rarely start from scratch and that this specific data to value project actually ran in reverse. We basically started with the end point and ended with the starting point, which was actually the data capture. And uh, um, the other point is that you need to involve end users, now that uh, you need to create ownership, approval and change management, and you have to take care of the end users and make sure that's something in for them. And uh, as uh, Joachim Dickhardt mentioned in, in this case study, really the three qualities of a good R&D informatics platform are flexibility, that is basically uh, a system that will be under continuous improvement and the system should be adaptable so that as research becomes more refined, the system can keep a, a pace with that. Performance, it needs to be able to serve up the information as fast as possible to the scientists. And it should be have good usability. The system needs to be intuitive and uh, should support research workflows and make the life easier for the scientists. So this is almost a summary of the presentation that I wanted to give, but of course, here are some take home messages. So as a take home, uh, I just want to reiterate that uh, data driven R&D really aims at accelerating innovation, which requires to solve the data interoperability challenge. And this can only be done with an open platform approach. And this is really key for chemicals and materials 
because of the incredible diversity and variability of the scientific workflows and data that we're dealing with. And that I've hopefully shown you a glimpse of how our customers are successfully implementing their data-driven R&D strategies using our platform. So uh, thank you very much. Again, uh, we are happy to answer questions in a written form. Uh, please submit those uh, via the platform and we will get back to you and uh, hopefully continue the conversation at a later stage. So thank you again for your time. It was a pleasure and uh, talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.